William Bonin was born in Willimantic, Connecticut, on January 8, 1947, the second of three sons born to Robert and Alice Bonin. Bonin's parents were alcoholics, and his father was a compulsive gambler who was physically abusive towards his wife and children. Bonin and his brothers were severely neglected as children, and were often fed and clothed by sympathetic neighbors. In addition, the brothers were often placed in the care of their grandfather, a convicted child molester who had molested Bonin's mother when she had been a child and adolescent, and who is known to have sexually abused his three grandsons. In 1953, Bonin's mother placed her sons in an orphanage in an effort to protect her children from their father's physical violence. This orphanage was known to severely discipline the children it housed for minor and major breaches of conduct, with the punishments administered including severe beatings, enduring various stress positions, and partial drowning in sinks filled with water. Although Bonin later freely discussed many aspects of his childhood and adolescence, he refused to discuss his memories of the orphanage beyond divulging that he consented to sexual advances from older males only if they would first tie his hands behind his back. He was to remain at the orphanage until the age of nine, when he returned to live with his parents in the town of Mansfield. At the age of ten, Bonin was arrested for stealing vehicle license plates and was placed in a juvenile detention center for various minor crimes. While housed at this juvenile detention center, he was repeatedly physically and sexually abused by several people, including his adult counselor. Four years later, in 1961, facing the prospect of the foreclosure of their home, Bonin's parents opted to relocate to California. The Bonin family settled in a modest home on Angel Street in the city of Downey shortly thereafter, Bonin's further died from cirrhosis of the liver. While living at this address, Bonin is known to have molested his younger brother and several neighborhood children. Many of these children were lured into Bonin's home with the promise of alcohol, and all his known victims were younger than he was. In addition to these acts of molestation, Bonin is known to have committed several acts of robbery, petty theft, and grand theft in his teenage years. Shortly after graduating from high school in 1965, Bonin became engaged to marry, this engagement had largely been at the behest of his mother, who believed the prospect of marriage would quell her son's evident homosexuality. The same year of his graduation, Bonin joined the U.S. Air Force. He later served five months of active duty in the Vietnam War as an aerial gunner, logging over 700 hours of combat and patrol time. Bonin was to later claim his experiences in Vietnam had instilled a belief within him that human life is overvalued. On one occasion, while under enemy fire, he risked his own life to save the life of a wounded fellow airman. For this act, Bonin received a medal in recognition of his gallantry. Bonin later claimed to have engaged in consensual sexual relations with males and females in Vietnam. He also later admitted to sexually assaulting two fellow soldiers at gunpoint during the period of the Tet Offensive. Bonin served three years in the U.S. Air Force before he received an honorable discharge in October 1968. Upon his discharge, Bonin returned to Downey to live with his mother. Shortly thereafter, he married his fiancée, the couple soon divorced. On November 17, 1968, at age 21. Bonin committed a sexual assault on a youth. He was to commit three further sexual assaults upon boys and youths over the following four months. The victims of these four assaults were aged between 12 and 18 and in each instance, he bound or otherwise restrained his victim before forcibly engaging in sodomy, oral copulation, and methods of torture which included bludgeoning and the squeezing of his victim's testicles. In early 1969, Bonin was arrested as he attempted to restrain a 16-year-old youth whom he had lured into his vehicle, he was indicted on five counts of kidnapping, four counts of sodomy, one count of oral copulation, and one count of child molestation against the five youths he had abducted and assaulted or, in the case of the final youth he had abducted, attempted to assault since the previous November. 
Bonin pleaded guilty to molestation and forced oral copulation and was sentenced to the Atascadero State Hospital as a mentally disordered sexual offender considered amenable to treatment in January 1971. While detained at this hospital, Bonin was subjected to a battery of psychiatric examinations, which revealed that he possessed a higher than average IQ of 121 and displayed traits of manic depression in addition to damage to the prefrontal cortex of his brain, which would likely reduce his ability to restrain any violent impulses. Bonin's physical examinations also revealed extensive scars on his head and buttocks, which he had likely sustained in the three years he had been housed at the Connecticut Juvenile Detention Center, although he claimed to have no memory of any such incidents of abuse. Two years after his arrival at the Atascadero State Hospital, Bonin was sent to prison, declared unsuitable for further treatment, largely due to his repeatedly engaging in forceful sexual activity with male inmates. On June 11, 1974, he was released from prison after doctors concluded he was no longer a danger to the health and safety of others. On September 8, 1974, Bonin encountered a 14-year-old named David Allen McVicker hitchhiking in Garden Grove. McVicker accepted Bonin's offer to drive him to his parents' home in Huntington Beach. Shortly after McVicker had entered Bonin's vehicle, he was taken aback by Bonin asking him if he was gay. When McVicker asked Bonin to stop his car, Bonin produced a gun and drove a youth to a deserted field, where he ordered McVicker to undress, then beat and raped him. After beating and assaulting McVicker, Bonin began to strangle the youth with his own t-shirt, then immediately became apologetic when McVicker began screaming. He then drove McVicker home before casually stating, We'll meet again. McVicker immediately informed his mother of the rape, she in turn notified Garden Grove police. Shortly thereafter, Bonin was charged with the rape and forcible oral copulation of a minor and the attempted abduction of a 15-year-old which had occurred two days after Bonin had assaulted McVicker. In this second instance, Bonin had sexually propositioned the 15-year-old, who had rejected Bonin's offer of $35 for sex. In response, Bonin had attempted to strike the youth with his vehicle. Bonin pleaded guilty to these charges, and on December 31, 1975, he was sentenced to serve between 1 and 15 years imprisonment, to be served at the California Men's Facility in San Luis Obispo. He was released from detention on October 11, 1978, albeit with 18 months supervised probation. Upon his release, Bonin moved to an apartment complex in Downey, approximately one mile from his mother's home and soon found employment as a truck driver for a Montebello delivery firm named Dependable Driveway. He also established a reputation among teenage boys in his neighborhood as a gregarious individual who allowed them to socialize in his apartment, and who bought alcohol for minors. In addition, Bonin dated a young woman whom, he informed acquaintances, he regularly accompanied to Anaheim on Sundays, to partake in her hobby of roller skating. Shortly after moving to his apartment, Bonin became acquainted with a 43-year-old neighbor named Everett Fraser. Bonin became a regular attendee at the frequent parties Fraser held at his apartment and, through these social gatherings, he became acquainted with a 21-year-old named Vernon Butts and an 18-year-old named Gregory Miley. Butts, a porcelain factory worker and part-time magician who held a fascination with occultism, later claimed to have been both fascinated with and terrified of Bonin, while freely admitting to taking a great delight in watching Bonin abuse and torture his victims. Miley, an illiterate Texas native with an IQ of 56 who supported himself with casual work, also actively participated in the murders he accompanied Bonin upon. Bonin usually selected young male hitchhikers, schoolboys or, occasionally, male prostitutes as his victims. The victims, aged 12 to 19, were either enticed or forced into his Ford Canolin van, where they were overpowered and bound hand and foot with a combination of handcuffs and wire or cords. They were then sexually assaulted, extensively beaten about the face, head and genitals, 
and tortured before typically being killed by strangulation with their own t-shirts, although some victims were stabbed or battered to death. One victim, Darren Kendrick, was forced to drink hydrochloric acid, three victims had ice picks driven into their ears and another victim, Mark Shelton, died of shock. In order to minimize the chances of a potential victim escaping from his vehicle, Bonin removed all inner handles from the passenger side and rear doors of his van, and stowed ligatures, knives, household tools and other instruments in his vehicle to facilitate the restraining and torture of his victims. The victims were usually killed inside his van before their bodies were discarded alongside or close to various freeways in Southern California. In a minimum of 12 of the murders, Bonin was assisted by one or more of his four known accomplices. According to one attorney present throughout Bonin's subsequent confession, the escalating levels of brutality he had exhibited towards his victims had been similar to that of a drug addict requiring an ever greater increase of dosage to attain a satisfactory level of euphoria, and Bonin later emphasized to neurologists he had felt an intense sense of excitement as he searched for his victims. The first murder for which Bonin was charged was that of a 13-year-old hitchhiker named Thomas Glenn Lundgren. Lundgren was last seen leaving his parents' house in Reseda at 10.50 a.m. on the morning of May 28, 1979. His body, clad only in a t-shirt, shoes and socks, was found the same afternoon in Agora. An autopsy revealed that Lundgren had suffered emasculation and bludgeoning to his face and head with his skull sustaining multiple fractures. In addition, the youth had been slashed across the throat, extensively stabbed, and strangled to death. His underwear, jeans, and severed genitals were discovered strewn in a field close to his body. In the abduction and murder of Lundgren, Bonin was assisted by Butts, who is suspected of accompanying or assisting Bonin on at least eight further murders attributed to the freeway killer. In mid-1979, Bonin was again arrested for molesting a 17-year-old boy in the coastal community of Dana Point. This violation of the conditions of his parole should have resulted in Bonin being returned to prison, however, an administrative error committed prior to Bonin's scheduled court date resulted in his release. Fraser drove to collect Bonin from the Orange County Jail where he had been incarcerated. He later recollected that as he drove Bonin home, Bonin made a statement which he, Fraser, had interpreted at the time as an expression of remorse, no one's going to testify again. This is never going to happen to me again. Two months after the murder of Lundgren, on August 4, 1979, Bonin and Butts abducted a 17-year-old named Mark Shelton shortly after the youth left his Westminster home to walk to a movie theater near Beach Boulevard. Screams were heard from the vicinity of the Shelton household by neighbors, leaving a strong possibility Shelton was abducted by force. The youth was violated with foreign objects including a pool cue, causing his body to enter a state of shock which proved fatal. His body was then discarded in San Bernardino County. The following day, Bonin and Butts encountered a 17-year-old West German student named Marcus Grabs attempting to hitchhike from Pacific Coast Highway. Grabs was bound with lengths of cord and ignition wire and driven to Bonin's home, where he was sodomized, beaten, and stabbed a total of 77 times before his nude body was discarded in Malibu Creek, close to Las Virgins Canyon Road. His body was found the following morning with one investigator likening the network of injuries inflicted upon the victim to that of a rabid dog unable to determine when to cease biting. On August 27, Bonin and Butts abducted a 15-year-old Hollywood youth named Donald Ray Hyden. Hyden was last seen alive walking along Santa Monica Boulevard at 1 a.m. His body was found by construction workers later the same morning in a dumpster located near the Oramp of the Ventura Freeway. Prior to his death by ligature strangulation, Haydn had been bound, beaten about the face, sodomized, then stabbed in the neck and genitalia and bludgeoned about the skull. Evident attempts had also been made to remove his testicles and slash his throat. Two weeks after the murder of Haydn, on September 9, 
Bonin and Butts encountered a 17-year-old Lamirida youth named David Louis Murillo cycling to a movie theater. Murillo was lured into Bonin's van, where he was bound, repeatedly raped, extensively bludgeoned about the skull with a tire iron, then strangled with a ligature before his nude body was thrown over an embankment into a bed of ivy alongside Highway 101. Eight days after the murder of Murillo, on September 17, an 18-year-old Newport Beach youth named Robert Christopher Wirostek was abducted as he cycled to his job at a grocery store. His body was found on September 27 alongside Interstate 10. Bonin is not known to have killed again until on or about November 1, when he and Butts abducted and murdered an unidentified young man approximately 5 feet 10 in in height, and estimated to be between 19 and 25 years old. This victim was savagely beaten, then strangled to death before his body was discarded in an irrigation ditch alongside State Route 99, south of Bakersfield. Although never identified, Bonin later estimated the age of this victim to be 23, and freely admitted to inserting an ice pick into this victim's nostrils and ear prior to his murder. Approximately four weeks later, Bonin, operating alone, abducted and strangled a 17-year-old bellflower youth named Frank Dennis Fox. His body was found two days later alongside the Ortega Highway, five miles east of San Juan Capistrano. The body itself bore signs of extensive blunt force trauma to the face and head, with ligature marks on the wrists and ankles indicating Fox had been bound throughout his ordeal. No clothing or other identifying evidence was discovered at the scene. Ten days after the murder of Fox, a 15-year-old Long Beach youth named John Frederick Kilpatrick disappeared after leaving his parents' home to socialize with friends. Kilpatrick was strangled to death before his body was discarded in a remote area of Rialto. His body was found on December 13. Kilpatrick remained known as a John Doe until August 5, 1980. On January 1, 1980. Bonin brutalized and strangled a 16-year-old Ontario youth named Michael Francis MacDonald. His fully clothed body was found alongside Highway 71 in western San Bernardino County two days after his murder, although his body was not identified until March 24. On February 3, Bonin drove from Downey to Hollywood in the company of 18-year-old Miley with the specific intention of committing a further murder. The pair encountered a 15-year-old named Charles Miranda standing close to the Starwood nightclub, hitchhiking along Santa Monica Boulevard. According to Miley, Bonin and Miranda engaged in consensual sexual activity in the rear of the van as he drove, before Bonin then whispered to Miley, Kid's going to die. Miranda was then overpowered and bound by Bonin, who then asked the youth how much money he had in his possession. When Miranda responded he had about six dollars, Bonin ordered Miley to take the youth's wallet, before raping his victim. Miley also attempted to rape the youth, but was unable to sustain an erection. In frustration, Miley assaulted Miranda with various sharp objects, before assisting Bonin in beating the youth. Bonin then strangled Miranda to death with a t-shirt and a tire iron as Miley repeatedly jumped on Miranda's chest. His nude corpse was then dumped in an alleyway alongside East 2nd Street in Los Angeles. Five minutes after the pair had discarded Miranda's body, Bonin suggested to Miley, I'm horny again, let's go and do another one. A few hours later, in Huntington Beach, the pair encountered a 12-year-old named James McCabe at a bus stop on the corner of Beach Boulevard and Slate Avenue. Macabre was lured into Bonin's van on the promise he would be driven to his intended destination of Disneyland. According to Miley, the boy entered the rear of the van voluntarily as Bonin drove to a grocery store parking lot, where he parked the van, and entered the rear of the vehicle. Miley then drove in an aimless manner for what he later described as being a very, very long distance. As he drove, Miley continually heard Macabre crying as Bone and beat and raped him, before forcing the boy to sleep in his arms. Miley then joined Bone in and beating the child and crushing his neck with a tire iron simply because he felt like doing so. Bone in then strangled Macabre to death with his own t-shirt, before the pair discarded his fully clothed, 
beaten body alongside a dumpster in the city of Walnut. Macabre's body was found three days later. On February 4, Bonin was arrested for violating the conditions of his parole. He was remanded in custody at the Orange County Jail until March 4. Ten days after Bonin had been released from custody, on March 14, he abducted and killed an 18-year-old Van Nuys youth named Ronald Gatlin. Gatlin was abducted shortly after he had left a friend's home. He was beaten, sodomized and suffered several deep, perforating ice pick wounds to the ear and neck before being strangled with a ligature. Gatlin's body, bound hand and foot, was found the following day in the city of Darty. One week later, on March 21, Bonin lured a 14-year-old named Glenn Barker into his van as the youth hitchhiked to school. Barker was also raped, beaten and strangled to death with a ligature, his body also bore evidence of numerous burns to the neck which had been inflicted with a lit cigarette. In addition, Barker had been violated with foreign objects which had extensively distended his rectum. At 4 p.m. the same day, a 15-year-old named Russell Rook was abducted from a bus stop in Garden Grove. Rook was bound, beaten and strangled to death after an estimated eight hours of captivity before his body was discarded alongside that of Barker in Cleveland National Forest. The youth's nude bodies were found on March 23. One Friday evening in March, 1980. Bonin offered a 17-year-old named William Rapu a ride home as the pair left Fraser's residence. Within minutes of accepting the ride, Bonin asked Pew whether he would like to engage in sex with him. Pew later stated he panicked and stuttered upon hearing this question and, after sitting in silence for several minutes, attempted to leave the vehicle once Bonin had slowed the van at a stoplight. In response, Bonin wordlessly leaned across and grabbed Pew by the collar dragging him back into the passenger seat. According to Pew, Bonin then confided in him that he enjoyed abducting young male hitchhikers on Friday and Saturday nights, whom he then restrained and abused before strangling them to death with their own t-shirts. In a matter-of-fact tone, Bonin then informed Pew, if you want to kill somebody, you should make a plan and find a place to dump the body before you even pick a victim. Bonin then informed Pew he had not chosen to refrain from assaulting and killing him out of sentiment, he'd been spared because the pair had been seen leaving Fraser's party together. Pew was driven to his home without being assaulted. On March 24, Bonin and Pew abducted a 15-year-old runaway named Harry Todd Turner from a Los Angeles street. Turner had absconded from a boy's home in the desert community of Lancaster four days prior to his meeting Bonin and Pew. Pew was to later testify that he and Bonin lured Turner into Bonin's van with an offer of $20 for sex. After binding, sodomizing and biting the youth, Bonin ordered Pew to beat him, Turner, up. After Pew had bludgeoned and beat Turner about the head and body for several minutes, Bonin strangled the youth to death with his own t-shirt before discarding his body at the rear delivery door to a Los Angeles business. Turner's autopsy subsequently revealed the youth's genitals had been mutilated, and he had received a total of eight fractures to the skull inflicted by a blunt instrument before he had been strangled. On the afternoon of April 10, Bonin abducted a 16-year-old bellflower youth named Stephen Johnwood as the youth walked to school. Having attended a dental appointment that morning, his nude, extensively beaten body was discarded in an alleyway in Long Beach, close to the Pacific Coast Highway. No clothing or other identifying evidence was discovered at the scene. Wood's autopsy revealed the youth had been killed by ligature strangulation. Three weeks later, on April 29, while parked in the grounds of a Stanton supermarket, Bonin and Butts lured a 19-year-old employee named Darren Kendrick into Bonin's van on the pretext of selling the youth drugs. Kendrick was driven to Butts' apartment, where he was overpowered and bound by both men. In addition to enduring sodomy and partial ligature strangulation, Kendrick was forced to drink hydrochloric acid by Bonin, causing caustic chemical burns to his mouth, chin, stomach and chest. Butts then drove an ice pick into Kendrick's ear, causing a fatal wound to the youth's cervical spinal cord. 
His body was discarded behind a warehouse close to the Artesia freeway, with the ice pick butts had driven into his skull still protruding from his ear. On May 12th, Bonin abducted and murdered a 17-year-old acquaintance of his whom he later stated he had decided to kill when he had awoken that morning because he was tired of having him around. The body of this acquaintance, Lawrence Sharp, was discarded behind a Westminster gas station. His body was found on May 18, and his autopsy revealed that in addition to being bound and sodomized, Sharp had been extensively beaten about the face and body, then strangled with a ligature. One week after the murder of Sharp, on May 19, Bonin asked Butts to accompany him on a killing. On this occasion, however, Butts reportedly refused to accompany him. Operating alone, Bonin abducted a 14-year-old Southgate youth named Sean King from a bus stop in Downey, killed him, then discarded his body in Live Oak Canyon, UK. Bonin then visited Butts' residence and bragged of the killing to his accomplice. Nine days after the murder of King, Bonin invited an 18-year-old homeless drifter named James Michael Monroe to move into the apartment he shared with his mother. Monroe had been evicted from his family's home in his native Michigan in early 1980 and had been living rough on the streets of Hollywood for several weeks. As such, Monroe readily accepted Bonin's accommodation offer. As had earlier been the case with Miley, Monroe, a bisexual who preferred sexual relations with females, also began a consensual sexual relationship with Bonin. He also accepted a subsequent offer of employment at the Montebello delivery firm where Bonin worked. Monroe later described his initial impression of Bonin as being a good guy, really normal, although on the evening of June 1, Bonin abruptly informed Monroe he wanted the two of them to abduct, rape, and kill a teenage hitchhiker. By early 1980, the murders committed by the freeway killer were receiving considerable media attention, and a reward totaling $50,000 for information leading to the conviction of the perpetrator or perpetrators had been offered by leading gay rights activists. Bonin avidly collected newspaper clippings documenting his own manhunt. Having by this stage determined a definitive link between many of the murders committed within the previous year, investigators from the various jurisdictions where victims had been abducted or discovered had themselves begun sharing information in their collective hunt for the perpetrator. Six officers from three of the jurisdictions in which the freeway killer had most regularly either abducted or deposited the bodies of his victims formed a task force dedicated to the apprehension of the suspect or suspects who, as one of the officers upon this assembled task force later recalled, was striking at an average rate of once every two weeks in the spring of 1980. By May 1980, Pew had been arrested for auto theft and was housed at the Los Padrinos Juvenile Courthouse. On May 29, Bue overheard the details of the ongoing murders on a local radio broadcast and confided to a counselor his recognition of the perpetrator's modus operandi as being that described to him by Bonin two months previous. This counselor reported Pew's suspicions to the police, who in turn relayed the information to an lapped homicide sergeant named John St. John. Upon hearing the confidential tip from the counselor, St. John conducted an extensive interview with Pew. Although Pew withheld the fact that he had actually accompanied Bonin on one of his murders, the information he provided led St. John to deduce that Bonin may have indeed been the freeway killer. McVicker had also contacted authorities by this time to report his suspicions that Bonin may be the perpetrator. His suspicions were not dismissed but regarded as one of many public tips to be investigated, a police investigation into Bonin's background revealed his extensive history of convictions for sexually assaulting teenage boys. Detective St. John assigned a surveillance team to monitor Bonin's movements. The surveillance of Bonin began on the evening of June 2, 1980. On June 2, the same day as police surveillance began, Bonin, accompanied by James Monroe, encountered an 18-year-old print shop worker named Stephen J. Wells standing at a bus stop on El Segundo Boulevard. Bonin and Monroe enticed the youth into the van. Upon learning Wells was bisexual, 
Bonin persuaded the youth to accompany him to his apartment on the promise he would be paid $200 if he allowed himself to be bound prior to engaging in sex. At Bonin's apartment, Wells was bound, raped, beaten about the face and torso, then informed he was to be murdered before he was strangled to death with his own t-shirt. 108. Bonin then placed Wells' body inside a cardboard box which he and Monroe then carried to his van. The pair then drove to the residence of Butts, whom Bonin first invited to view Wells' body with the enticement, we got it in the van, it's a good one. Come on out and see it. According to Monroe, upon viewing the body, Butts replied, oh, you got another one? Before Bonin asked for advice as to how to dispose of it. At Bonin's subsequent trial, Monroe recalled Butts' response, try a gas station like or where, I don't know which, we dumped the last one. Monroe also later testified that Butts had actively dissuaded Bonin from discarding the youth's body in the nearby canyons due to the late hour. Wells' body was instead discarded behind a disused Huntington Beach gas station, where it was found five hours later. After nine days of surveillance, on June 11, 1980, police observed Bonin driving in a seemingly random manner throughout Hollywood, unsuccessfully attempting to lure five separate teenage boys into his van, before succeeding in luring the youth into his vehicle. The police followed Bonin until his van parked in a desolate parking lot close to the Hollywood freeway, then discreetly approached the vehicle. Upon hearing muffled screams and banging sounds emanating from inside the van, these plainclothes officers forced their way into the vehicle, discovering Bonin in the act of raping a 17-year-old Orange County runaway named Harold Eugene Tate, whom he had handcuffed and bound. Initially charged with the rape of a minor and held on suspicion of the murder of Miranda, Bonin was detained in lieu of $250,000 bond. The following day, Monroe stole Bonin's car and fled to his native Michigan. Inside Bonin's van, investigators discovered numerous artifacts attesting to his culpability in the freeway killer murders. These items included various restraining devices including lengths of nylon cord an assortment of knives, a tire iron, and household implements such as pliers and coat hangers. Furthermore, the interior of Bonin's van and sections of his home were extensively bloodstained, and the inner handles from the passenger side and rear doors of his vehicle had been removed in an obvious effort to prevent victims from escaping the vehicle. Inside the glove box, investigators also discovered a scrapbook of newspaper clippings related to the murders. Although initially protesting his innocence in any of the murders, Bonin confessed his guilt to St. John after reading an impassioned letter from the mother of King, imploring him to reveal the location of her son's body. Over the course of several evenings, Bonin confessed to abducting, raping, and killing 21 boys and young men. He expressed no remorse for his actions, but he did demonstrate extreme embarrassment and regret over having been caught. His primary accomplice throughout his killing spree, Bonin stated, had been Butts, with Miley and Monroe being active accomplices in other murders. Bonin later told one reporter who asked him what he would be doing if he were still at large, I'd still be killing, I couldn't stop killing. It got easier with each one we did. Bonin was physically linked to many of the murders by blood and semen stains, and numerous Distinctive green triskelion shaped carpet fibers found upon seven of the victims' bodies which were forensically proven to be a precise match with the carpeting in the rear of Bonin's van. Furthermore, upon three victims' bodies, investigators had discovered hair samples which had proven to be a precise match with Bonin. Medical evidence also revealed that six of the murders for which Bonin was charged were committed by a unique windless strangulation method which was referred to by the prosecutor at Bonin's Los Angeles County trial as a signature, a trademark. Initially formally arraigned for the murder of Grabs on July 25, by July 29, Bonin had been charged with an additional 15 murders to which he had confessed and upon which the prosecution believed they had sufficient evidence to obtain a conviction. In addition to the 16 murder indictments, Bonin was also charged with 11 counts of robbery, one count of sodomy, and one count of mayhem.
he was held without bond, and on August 8, these charges were formally submitted against him. Three days later, in accordance with Penal Code Section 987, Bonin, at this stage without legal representation, was appointed an attorney named Earl Hansen to act as his legal representative. Hansen remained Bonin's attorney until October 1981 when, at Bonin's request, he was replaced by William Charvet and Tracy Stewart. Based on Bonin's confession, police obtained a warrant authorizing a search of Butts Lakewood property on the same date as Bonin's initial arraignment. This July 25th search uncovered evidence linking Butts to several of the murders to which Bonin had already confessed, and Butts was brought before a municipal court on July 29th, charged with accompanying Bonin on six murders committed between August 1979 and April 1980. He was also charged with three counts of robbery. In a press statement relating to the police investigation into the murders issued on this date, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department stated, Bonin and Butts are believed to be responsible for the kidnapping, torture and murder of at least 21 young males between May 1979 and June 1980 inches, before adding that five further murder charges would likely be filed against the men in Orange County. Despite proclaiming his innocence, Butts confessed to having accompanied Bonin upon each of the murder forays in each of the charges listed against him, and to have actively participated in the sexual abuse of several victims. Butts was adamant he had had only a limited role in the torture of the victims, but confessed to actively participating in the torture of one victim. Butts claimed he typically drove in a nameless manner as Bonin abused and tortured his victims in the rear of the van then stopped the vehicle in order to assist in restraining the victim as Bonin escalated the torture. When asked as to why some victims had been subjected to more extensive blunt force trauma than others, Butts stated that, in many instances, Bonin would escalate the level of beatings to which he subjected his victim if the youth resisted his sexual advances. Butts was brought before Orange County Municipal Court Judge Richard Osgo on November 14, 1980. On this date, he was formally charged with participating in three further murders committed in this county. His trial was scheduled for July 27, 1981. On July 31, Monroe was arrested in his hometown of Port Huron, Michigan. He was extradited to California, charged with the murder of Wells. Monroe pleaded innocent to all charges against him on August 14. On August 22, Miley by this stage 19 years old, was arrested in Texas and subsequently charged by California authorities with the murders of Miranda and McCobb. Miley was arrested after having confessed to his culpability in these February 3rd murders in a recorded phone conversation with a friend, thus substantiating Bonin's earlier confession. He initially pleaded innocent to two charges of first-degree murder on December 18th but pleaded guilty at two separate pretrial hearings in May 1981. At a preliminary hearing held in Los Angeles County before Los Angeles Superior Court Judge Julius Letham on January 2, 1981, Bonin formally pleaded his innocence to 14 first-degree murder charges and numerous counts or sodomy, robbery and mayhem. In 11 of these indictments, a felony murder robbery special circumstance was also alleged. He was ordered to return to court on January 7 for pre-trial motions and the formal setting of a trial date, which was eventually set for October 19. On the same date, January 2, Butts was arraigned on five counts of murder, in addition to three counts of robbery. The date of Butts' formal plea was delayed by Judge Letham until January 7. Four days after his formal plea before Judge Letham, Butts committed suicide by hanging himself with a towel in his cell. A subsequent coroner's investigation revealed Butts had unsuccessfully attempted to take his own life on at least four occasions prior to his arrest. His attorney, Joe Ingeber, theorized that Butts' depressive state had been magnified by the impending release of transcripts of his client's testimony at the preliminary hearing, in which Butts had graphically described the torture the victims had endured prior to their murder. Prior to Bonin's impending trials, 
Miley and Monroe had agreed to testify against him at the trials in exchange for being spared the death penalty, with Deputy District Attorney Sterling Norris also agreeing to seek the dismissal of additional charges of sodomy and robbery filed against Monroe if he honored his agreement to testify. In the case of Miley, Norris agreed to accept two separate pleas of guilty to first-degree murder in exchange for two consecutive sentences of life imprisonment, with a possibility of parole after 25 years, if Miley agreed to testify against Bonin at the trials. Prior to his suicide, Butts never formally agreed to either testify against Bonin, or to accept any form of plea bargain. Bonin was brought to trial in Los Angeles County charged with the murder of 12 of his victims whose bodies had been found within this constituency, on October 19, 1981. He was tried before Superior Court Judge William Keane. The trial commenced on November 5, 1981. Norris, acting as prosecutor, sought the death penalty for each count of murder for which Bonin was tried, stating in his opening speech to the jury, we will prove he is the freeway killer as he has bragged to a number of witnesses. We will show you that he enjoyed the killings. Not only did he enjoy it, and plan to enjoy it, he had an insatiable demand, an insatiable appetite, not only for sodomy, but for killing. Norris further elaborated that Bonin had followed a depressingly familiar routine in his murders of luring or forcing his victim into the van, before overpowering and binding his victim. He would then repeatedly rape his captive between and throughout instances of torture, before finally reaching the climax of the orgy by killing his victim. Norris further asserted that Bonin considered murder a group sport, and would typically groom people of a low mentality to participate in many of his murders. Miley and Monroe testified against Bonin at his Los Angeles County trial, describing in graphic detail the murders in which they had accompanied Bonin. In his testimony, delivered on November 17, Monroe stated that shortly after the murder of Wells, he and Bonin drove to a McDonald's restaurant and purchased hamburgers with $10 taken from Wells's wallet. As they had eaten the burgers at Bonin's home, Bonin laughed and mused, Thanks, Steve, wherever you are, before Monroe had also joined in the laughter. Miley testified to his participation in the murders of Miranda and Macabre describing in graphic detail how they were beaten and tortured with various instruments before their murders, and how he had heard a bunch of bones cracking as Bonin had pressed a tire iron against Miranda's neck. Miley continued his testimony with the words, The kid vomited. I jumped down on him the same way, killing the guy. Several members of the audience rushed out of the courtroom as Bonin's accomplices delivered their testimony, later stating to reporters gathered outside the courtroom they had found the recited details too nauseating. The strategy of Bonin's defense attorneys, Charvet and Stewart, was to challenge the credibility of numerous prosecution witnesses, and to suggest that extremely significant mitigating factors as to the root causes of Bonin's behavior lay in the extensive physical, sexual, and emotional abuse he had endured throughout his early life. To support this contention, Bonin's defense attorneys summoned Dr. David Foster, an expert on the developmental effects of violence and abuse on children, to testify as to the conclusions of his psychological examinations upon Bonin. Foster opined that Bonin had, as a result of repeated abandonment, not received the nurturing, protection, and behavioral feedback as a child necessary for sufficient psychological development. This had been so consistent and prevalent, he stated, that Bonin held a confusion as to the differences between violence and love. In a direct rebuttal, the prosecution summoned Park Dietz, a forensic psychiatrist and expert in impulse control disorder and sexual sadism disorder, who testified that the overall pattern of Bonin's behavior was inconsistent with an inability to control his impulses. Dietz further testified as to Bonin's actions being reflective of planning as opposed to impulsive behavior. In summary, Dietz concluded that Bonin was a sexual sadist, and that although he suffered from an antisocial personality disorder, neither of these conditions had impaired his ability to control his actions. Against overruled objections from Bonin's defense attorney, 
a Fresno-based reporter named David Lopez waived his previously sought immunity under California's shield law and agreed to testify on behalf of the prosecution as to the details of seven interviews Bonin had granted him between December 1980 and April 1981. In his testimony, given on December 14 and 15, Lopez stated Bonin had first informed him he would refuse to talk with any other reporter if Lopez would agree not to broadcast the precise details of the interview. Lopez had agreed to these conditions, and Bonin had confessed to him on January 9 that he was indeed the freeway killer, and that he had killed 21 victims. The victims' ages, Bonin had confided, had ranged between 12 and 19, with his youngest victim, Macabre being the easiest victim to kill. According to Lopez, Bonin had confided that although he resented the prospect of being executed, he had opted to kill repeatedly simply because he had enjoyed the sound of kids dying. Lopez also testified Bonin had informed him he had killed one victim by repeatedly punching him in the throat, and that the primary incentive for his revealing the location of King's body to authorities had been the knowledge police would purchase hamburgers as they searched San Bernardino County for the remains. Upon cross-examination, Bonin's defense attorney ensured Lopez conceded his testimony was based upon what he had recalled from the interviews as opposed to any handwritten notes, although he strenuously denied he had received any form of payment to testify. Closing arguments lasted from December 16 to December 22, 1981. In his closing argument on behalf of the prosecution, Norris described Bonin as an insatiable, callous individual who acted with malice aforethought, and who derived extreme pleasure from the suffering he inflicted upon his victims. Having outlined the torture Bonin's victims had endured, Norris concluded his closing arguments by urging the jury to give him, Bonin what he has earned. Defense attorney Charvet began his closing argument in defense of Bonin on December 21. Although Charvet did not specifically ask the jurors to find Bonin not guilty, he did request they only return the reasonable verdict you can bring, indicating a likelihood of not guilty verdicts on at least some counts upon which Bonin stood charged. Charvet then hearkened towards the credibility of some of the delivered testimony, pouring particular scorn upon Miley and Monroe, whom he emphasized had turned state's evidence, and thus, he alleged, had tailored their testimony to the desires of the police. As such, Charvet called their testimony unbelievable. Charvet repeatedly reminded the jury he had exposed myriad inconsistencies in the testimony of Monroe's account of the murder of Wells in the various statements he had given, and had compelled him to admit that he lied on numerous occasions. Charvet also reminded the jury of the extensive abuse Bonin had endured as a child, and of the diagnoses doctors at the Atascadero State Hospital had reached between 1969 and 1971. Contending the prosecution's case was full of holes, he then alleged the prosecution had resorted to what amounted to little more than revulsion tactics in the hope Bonin would be convicted upon that basis. Following these closing arguments, Judge Keane ordered the trial recessed until December 28, when he delivered his final instructions to the jury, who then formally began their deliberations. Bonin's first trial lasted until January 6, 1982. On this date, the jury convicted Bonin of ten of the murders for which he was tried, although he was found not guilty of the murders of Lundgren and King, of committing sodomy upon grabs of committing mayhem upon Lundgren, and of robbing one other victim. As these verdicts were read by the clerk of court, many relatives and friends of Bonin's victims wept openly. The following day, the prosecution and defense made alternate pleas for the actual sentence the jury should decide, Norris requesting the death penalty, Charvet requesting life imprisonment. On January 20, the jury further found that the special circumstances required within California law, multiple murders and robbery, had been met in the ten murder cases for which they had found Bonin guilty, and thus unanimously recommended he receive the death penalty. Bonin was cleared of the sodomy and murder of King because he had led police to the body of the victim in December 1980, with the agreement that his leading police to the body could not be used against him in court 
and therefore the prosecutors had discussed King's disappearance at the trial, but not the discovery of his body he was cleared of the charges of mayhem and murder against Lundgren because, according to Lopez, he had strenuously denied committing this particular killing in the interviews he had granted to him. In response to the recommendations of the jury, Judge Keane ordered a reconvening of court on February 24, upon which date Charvet was to argue for a modification of the sentence recommended by the jury. Despite an impassioned appeal by Charvet, Keane formally sentenced Bonin to death for the ten murders of which he was convicted on March 12. Describing the murders as a gross, revolting affront to human dignity, Keane further ordered at this hearing that if Bonin's death sentence were commuted to one of life imprisonment, the sentences should run consecutively. Bonin was then ordered to be remanded to the warden of San Quentin State Prison, to await execution in the gas chamber. He remained unmoved upon receipt of this sentence, having earlier informed his attorney he had fully expected to formally receive the death penalty. Bonin was brought to trial in neighboring Orange County, charged with the robbery and murder of four further victims who had been found murdered within this jurisdiction between November 1979 and May 1980, on March 21, 1983. He was tried before Superior Court Judge Kenneth Lee. Prior to this second trial, Bonin was temporarily removed from death row and held in solitary confinement, where he remained until the conclusion of the trial. While incarcerated in this capacity, Charvet attempted to secure a change of venue, citing the extensive pre-trial publicity surrounding the case minimizing the chances of securing an untainted jury within this jurisdiction, however, this motion was refused by Judge Lee who ruled in November 1982 that there had only been minimal publicity surrounding the freeway killer case in Orange County following Bonin's earlier convictions. Initial jury selection began on March 21, and saw a total of 204 prospective jurors subjected to the process of voir dire selection until 16 were picked in June. Upon completion of jury selection process, Bonin's attorney renewed his motion that the trial should be moved to a jurisdiction outside of Orange County due to pre-trial publicity tainting the jury pool. This motion was again rejected by Lee, who ruled that the trial would begin on June 14. The prosecutor at Bonin's Orange County trial, Brian Brown, contended that all four victims killed within this constituency had been abducted while hitchhiking then ordered to strip before being bound about the wrists and ankles. Each of the four victims had then endured rape, bettings, torture, and finally ligature strangulation. In each instance, the ligature had left an impression measuring approximately one half of an inch upon the victim's neck. Brown also hearkened toward the similarities in each of these murders and two of those for which Bonin had earlier been convicted in Los Angeles County. Miranda and Wells. Particular emphasis was placed upon the fiber evidence found upon each of the Orange County victims, in addition to three victims killed in Los Angeles County, being a precise match to the distinctive carpeting in the rear of Bonin's van. As such, Brown stated, the four Orange County victims had been killed by the same individual who had killed Miranda and Wells, and his accomplices in these two murders, Miley and Monroe would testify as to their accompanying Bonin on each of these murders. To further support this contention, the prosecution also presented forensic experts who testified that the fibers discovered upon the bodies of all six victims in question were a precise match with the carpeting in Bonin's van. The interior of the van had also been extensively stained with human blood. In reference to the evidence found within the van itself, Brown stated to the jury, one can truly say from the evidence found within the van it is a virtual death wagon. These contentions were refuted by Charvet, who contended that any similarities in modus operandi did not constitute automatic proof of his client's guilt, and that the evidence presented did not support the prosecution's contention beyond a reasonable doubt that Bonin had murdered any of the four Orange County victims, or the two victims killed in Los Angeles County. Specifically, Charvet attacked the credibility of Monroe, and further contended Bonin was simply a scapegoat for four unsolved murders. During the six-week trial, 
Bonin's attorneys called two witnesses in his defense, one of whom was Monroe, who conceded Bonin had communicated with him prior to his testifying in this second trial, requesting he lie when called to deliver his testimony. Following less than three hours of deliberations, the jury announced on August 2, 1983, that they had found Bonin guilty of each of the four murders, in addition to three counts of robbery. After three days of deliberations as to the actual penalty to be imposed upon Bonin, the jury announced on August 22 their recommendations that he be sentenced to death on each count. Judge Lee postponed formal sentencing until August 26. On this date, Bonin received four further death sentences, with Lee describing Bonin as sadistic and guilty of monstrous criminal conduct. Bonin was to remain incarcerated on death row for 14 years at San Quentin State Prison, awaiting execution in the gas chamber. In his years on death row, he undertook painting and writing as hobbies, and received several minor awards for his artwork, short stories and poems. He also corresponded with numerous individuals, including the mothers of some of his victims, in the correspondence exchanged with his victims' relatives. Bonin never expressed any regret or remorse over having murdered their sons. On one occasion, Bonin informed King's mother that her son had been his favorite victim as he was such a screamer. Bonin also contended to his defense attorneys, in addition to several people with whom he corresponded, that Butts had been the actual ringleader behind the murders, and that he had simply been Butts' accomplice. These claims would be refuted by Norris, the prosecutor at Bonin's Los Angeles County murder trial, who recollected shortly before Bonin's execution, he was the leader, and he chose weak people he could use. The method of Bonin's execution was superseded with lethal injection by the state of California in 1992, following the execution of Robert Alton Harris, the first inmate California had executed since 1967. Harris had exhibited evident symptoms of discomfort for up to four minutes throughout his 15-minute execution in the gas chamber. These symptoms had included convulsions. As such, the state of California opted to use lethal injection as an alternate method of execution to the gas chamber, branding the gas chamber a cruel and unusual method of execution. Bonin filed numerous appeals against his convictions and sentencing citing issues such as jury prejudice, the potential of jury inflammation via listening to victim impact statements, which his defense had offered to stipulate at Bonin's trials, an inadequate defense as the basis for each appeal. For these appeals, Bonin hired new lawyers, who initially submitted contentions that his previous defense attorney, Charvet, had provided inadequate defense at his trials by failing to place sufficient emphasis upon Bonin's bipolar disorder and the sexual abuse he had endured as a child. These lawyers contended that had Charvet placed further emphasis on these issues, Bonin would have been humanized in the eyes of his juries. Each successive appeal proved unsuccessful, with the U.S. Supreme Court refusing to overturn the death penalty convictions for the murders in which Bonin had been tried in August 1988 and January 1989. Despite upholding Bonin's convictions, the Supreme Court poured scorn upon the judge at Bonin's Los Angeles County trial, William Keane, for failing to fully heed a warning given by the prosecution prior to trial that Monroe had discussed the possibility of agreeing to legal representation by Charvet prior to his appearance at trial. Despite admonishing Charvet for a potential conflict of interest, Judge Keane had permitted him to act as Bonin's defense attorney at his first trial. In spite of this fact, the Supreme Court ruled in 1989 that Charvet had effectively cross-examined Monroe at trial and that Keane's actions, though ruled as inexplicable, had not effectively harmed Bonin's legal defense. Further merit was given to Bonin's contention that his defense should have been allowed to stipulate the testimony of the parents of his victims being allowed to identify photographs of their sons in both life and death at his trials. Despite this ruling, this finding was also deemed not to have affected the overall verdict. A final submission to the United States Court of Appeals was submitted in October 1994, with Bonin contending such issues as his being denied the effective assistance of counsel at his trials, 
that he had been denied due process at his Los Angeles trial due to the judges refusing to suppress the testimony of Monroe and Miley, and that the judge at his Orange County trial had denied his counsel's motion for a change of venue upon the basis that pretrial publicity had effectively minimized any chance of obtaining an unbiased jury within the county. This final appeal was rejected on June 28, 1995 with the appellate judges stating they had found no evidence of legal misconduct, and that no evidence existed that the 13 jurors who served upon Bonin's Orange County trial who had admitted to minimal, indirect pretrial exposure to the freeway killer case had, as a result of this pretrial publicity, been incapable of judging Bonin with impartiality. As such, the appellate judges declared their satisfaction with the validity of Bonin's convictions. On February 20, 1996, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals rejected a plea for clemency submitted by Bonin's attorneys on the grounds of inadequate legal representation at both his trials. Scarcely one hour prior to his scheduled execution, the Supreme Court refused to hear Bonin's final plea to overturn his death sentence, with the convened panel in almost unanimous agreement that Bonin's own attorneys had not failed to give their client adequate legal representation by not earlier discovering their submitted claims to have discovered evidence attesting to Bonin's innocence. Furthermore, these appellate judges ruled that Bonin's attorneys should not have waited until the last minute to submit arguments to overturn or postpone the impending death sentence of their client. These convened judges also rejected Bonin's final claim that he had a right to choose between the gas chamber or lethal injection as his actual method of execution. Bonin was executed by lethal injection inside the gas chamber at San Quentin State Prison on February 23, 1996. He was the first person to be executed by lethal injection in the history of California and his execution occurred 14 years after his first death sentence had been imposed. In a final interview given to a local radio station less than 24 hours before he was executed, Bonin claimed he had made peace with the fact he was about to die. He added that his only real regret was that he had not pursued his teenage passion of bowling long enough to have turned professional. When asked whether there was anything he had to say to the families of his victims, Bonin stated, they feel my death will bring closure, but that's not the case. They're going to find out. At 6 p.m. on the day he was executed, Bonin was moved from his cell to a death watch cell, where he ordered his last meal, two large pizzas, three pints of ice cream and three six-packs of coke. His final hours were spent in the company of five individuals whom he had chosen for this occasion. These included his attorney, chaplain and a prospective biographer. Each later stated that Bonin seemed resigned to his fate, his attorney also added that he had not detected any remorse in his client. At 11.45 p.m., Bonin was escorted from his holding cell into the execution chamber. In his final statement, given to the prison warden one hour prior to his scheduled execution at midnight, Bonin again expressed no remorse for his crimes and left a note that stated, I feel the death penalty is not an answer to the problems at hand. I feel it sends the wronger message to the people of this country. Young people act as they see other people acting instead of as people tell them to act. I would advise that when a person has a thought of doing anything serious against the law, that before they did, they should go to a quiet place and think about it seriously. Bonin was pronounced dead at 12.13 a.m. He was 49 at the time of his execution. None of Bonin's relatives chose to witness his execution. The event was witnessed by several relatives of his victims, many of whom wept and embraced when his death was officially confirmed. According to several of these witnesses, Bonin's execution passed without complications, and he was heavily sedated throughout the latter stages of the procedure. On this subject, then-Governor Pete Wilson, who had rejected a submitted plea for clemency from Bonin's attorneys three days prior to the execution, referred to Bonin as the poster boy for capital punishment, before adding that California's method of execution ensured his death was infinitely more pleasant than that endured by his victims.